Now, we've been in a series uh, for the last seven weeks in which we've been looking at the parables of Jesus. And if you don't know what a parable is, it's simply a made-up story. It's just a story that Jesus would make up, typically on the spot. And, and Scripture says that there's actually two reasons that Jesus made up these stories. The first one might surprise you. Scripture says that Jesus used these parables to not actually give truth, but to hide it. And he would tell these stories to hide truth from the prideful and the arrogant. Jesus quoted an Old Testament passage where he said, look, they got ears, but they're not listening, they're not hearing. They've got eyes, but they're not seeing. But then Jesus also, we're told, used these parables as a teaching tool to impart truth in a very transformative, meaningful ways to those who had humble hearts. You know, I mean, how many of you love a good story? Right? You, I could stand up here and just tell you a, a truth statement, a fact statement. And you're like, oh yeah, that's true. But if I can tell you a story that captivates your heart and your mind, that's actually a vehicle to deliver that truth, it just gets inside of us in a different way. And that's what Jesus did, but it only worked for the humble of heart. And I want to encourage us as a church family this morning, as we're coming to look at God's word, and especially as we're coming to look at these parables, we just need to take a moment and put on some humility. If we're coming with prideful arrogance, it's not going to work. But when we come to the Word of God, anytime we come to the Word of God, your greatest asset, not your study Bible, it's not you know, the different preachers you listen to online, it's not your commentaries, your greatest asset is your humility. And what humility looks like, at least for me, what I try to do when I'm studying God's Word, number one, I go, God, you're God, and I'm not which means number two, you probably know some things that I don't. And number three, there's probably some things that I don't understand and I don't even like, but you say are true. So I'm gonna receive those things and realign my life with them, right? And Jesus says that's the type of heart that he can work with. That's the type of heart that can be changed and transformed that can receive these truths that he's giving. So that, that's what I want to encourage us this morning. We're going to look at a great parable this morning. It's about prayer. How many of you like to pray? Right? You're in church. You have to raise your hand. <laughs> okay? Don't raise your hand on this one. How many of you would say, like, you're just good at praying? Like, I'm just an awesome prayer, right? Uh, how many of you enjoy praying? You know, just like, oh, yeah, this is like my favorite thing to do. Yeah. Some of us, let me ask you another question. How's your batting average when it comes to prayer? Like when you pray, how often does it actually happen? For some of us, maybe better than others, worse than others. But it's interesting because what we're going to see Jesus say today is that as followers of Christ, we should have a really good batting average. Jesus will make these crazy statements. He'll say things like this. Whatever you ask in my name, the Father is going to do for you. And I look at my life and I go, my batting average isn't that good, Jesus. (laughs) And we're going to read a parable, a story that Jesus made up in response to his disciples coming to him and saying, Jesus, your batting average is great. How can we pray like that? Because when you pray, it happens. When we pray, it doesn't. And so Jesus told him a story. It's found in Luke chapter 11, verse 5. You can turn there in your Bibles if you have it. If not, we'll be uh, showing the verses on the screen. But Jesus is going to tell this parable, and and we're going to look at it, and then we're also going to see a road map that Jesus gives us to increase our batting average in prayer. Here's the story. Luke 11, verse 5. Jesus said to them, to his disciples, in response to the question, how do we pray better? He said, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. Now you gotta understand, this, the Jewish culture was a, a culture of hospitality. So if you welcome someone into your home, you better have some food to present for them. Uh, I just had dinner, my family and I did, with some Persian friends of ours last week. And same, same, same with that culture. And it was just like food after food after food. And you're just like, this is amazing. I mean, it's just, it's inbred to them. And the, the thought of welcoming someone into your home and not having food, it was like, no, unheard of. I'm gonna do whatever it takes to find this food, okay? So he goes, it's late at night. 
he goes to his buddy's house and says, you gotta hook me up. I need some bread to feed this, this guest of mine. And Jesus says, and suppose, again, he's making up a story. Suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked. My children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Now, look, you just picture it. Here's this guy. He's asleep in bed, but he's got kids. How many of you got kids, right? How many of you know once the kids go to bed, you don't want anything to happen to wake them up? Like, I got five kids. They'll all go to sleep, and Sarah and I just sit back on the couch like, oh, thank you, Jesus. And then one will wake up crying, upset, and I run up, and the first thing I do is, shh, you're going to wake up the other kids. Be quiet, right? And so here's this guy. He's, he's in bed, and he's finally gotten his kids asleep, and this, this you know, just persistent, irritating neighbor comes. Bam, 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 bam. Shh, you're going to wake up the kids. We have some close friends of ours, uh, Brandy and Kinda. They just had twin baby girls. They're gorgeous. And I was asking Kinda, I was like, like, what happens when one wakes up and you're trying to keep the other one asleep? You know, I was like, we had a hard enough time with one baby. How do you do it with two, right? And so here's this guy, and he's just like, my kids are asleep. Just be quiet. Look at what Jesus says next. He's kind of interpreting the story for us. He says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Look, you're going to wake up my kids unless I just give you what you want. So I'm going to get up, give you what you need because I don't want to be disturbed anymore. And I love the phrase that Jesus used, shameless audacity. The whole picture is, look, if we come in prayer to our Heavenly Father and we don't get the answer we're looking for, if God says no or not yet or he's just not responding, we're not hearing an answer, Jesus says, I want you to pray with shameless audacity. Shameless, meaning I'm not going to feel shamed if I don't get the answer right away. I'm not going to feel like God's ridiculing me. I'm just going to keep knocking and knocking and knocking and just go on asking. Now, Jesus continues, verse 9, and he kind of gives us the moral of the story. So I say to you, Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Jesus seems to be saying that one of the ways that we can increase our batting average, so to speak, in our prayer life is learning how to be shameless, is learning how to be audacious in our asking. Now, I was teaching my kids, and and I've, you know, shared this parable with my kids in the past, because we love to teach them to pray, and and we love when they're praying for other people. And and last week, (laughs) my, my son Sawyer comes back from one of his neighbor, you know, one of the neighbors, one of his friends, and I can tell, like, something's gone on. He's in trouble. I'm like, Sawyer, what'd you do? He's like, well, I was at Samson's house and Samson asked if I could stay for dinner and his mom said no. So I told Samson, look, Samson, you just got to keep asking her and keep asking her and keep asking her because that's what the Bible says. And I'm like, okay, he's getting it. I'm like, okay, bud, but there's also the verse that says, honor thy father and thy mother, you know, you know, and so yeah, you got to translate these things for him, but he had the right idea. And he saw it work out in the practical. If I just keep asking, I'm just going to wear them out. And then I'll get what I'm asking for. And Jesus seems to be saying the exact same thing. He's saying, when you're praying, I want you to pray with shameless audacity so that you come to the door of heaven and you say, I know you're in there. I'm not going away. I'm going to wake you up, God, and all your angels too until you do the thing that I'm asked. Doesn't that almost sound sacrilegious? But it's scriptural. In Isaiah 62, verse 7, I think it is, the prophet is is speaking to to the nation of Israel. And he says, God has, has put watchmen on the walls. They're prayer warriors that are praying. And and then Isaiah the prophet gives a message to him. He says, Give yourselves no rest and give the Lord no rest until he fulfills his promise and makes Jerusalem a praise in all the nations. God's like, don't let me sleep. 
if you're asking for something in faith, you need to have some shameless audacity and go for it. And I was thinking, okay, well, what, what keeps me, maybe what keeps us as a church family from praying some of those audacious, shameless prayers? I came up with a few things, and there's probably several more, but I thought I'd at least begin by sharing these with you. I think skepticism is one of them. Sometimes we don't pray like that simply because we just don't think God really is as good as he says he is. We don't think God cares. We're like, ah, I just don't think he's going to answer. What's the point? We're just skeptical. Yeah, I know Jesus told me to pray like that, but eh, I'm just not sure I believe it. I think for some of us, uh, it, it, there's this fear and this shame that have come in. We look at our lives and we say, yeah, I just don't think I've earned the answer to prayer that I'm going after right now. I've got some, just this fear in my life that I'm just not good enough, that God's not good enough, and I've got this shame over things I've done in the past, and the enemy's come in and is using that to keep you from praying these shameless, audacious prayers. And then for some of us, I think we're just bored, honestly, with prayer. That boredom comes in. Uh, you don't need to raise your hand, but, but how many of you grew up in like a Catholic home? My whole mom's side of the family is like that. And my mom stopped praying simply because she got bored with it. She's like, oh, prayer is just saying my Hail Marys. Prayer is just saying, you know, the Our Fathers over and over and over again. And there's just no life. There's no passion. And it's like, why would I keep doing that? It's just like, ah, right? That's not how Jesus seems to depict what prayer looks like. And so we're going to look today, not only at this parable, but what I believe is a road map that Jesus gives us to learn how to pray and to learn how to pray prayers that actually get answered. Dwight L. Moody once said, Jesus never taught his disciples how to preach. He only taught them how to pray. And so let's look at how Jesus teaches us how to pray this morning so that we can get some prayers that actually get answered. Now, right before Jesus tells this parable in verse one of, of chapter 11, he gives the shortened version of what's called, or what's been come to be called, the Lord's Prayer. Now, I want to look together at it this morning, but I want to look at the longer version that's found in Matthew chapter 6. And I know some of you are like, okay, tuning out, I've heard the Lord's Prayer, I've heard a bunch of preachers preach on the Lord's Prayer, just stick with me. This might be a little different, okay? Let's look at this together. We'll read it, and then we'll dissect it, and we'll see what the roadmap is. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Okay? Jesus gives us prayer and he's not instructing us to say every time you pray, pray you, you just pray this verbatim. He's literally giving us a road map of what prayer is supposed to look like. What shameless, audacious prayers are to look like. And if we follow this roadmap, what it's going to do is actually boost our confidence so that we can pray like that persistent neighbor. Now, I'm going to give you what the three keys are, I believe, that Jesus lists for us here up front, and then we'll go back and talk about them. This is the roadmap, okay? Number one, I think Jesus is going to say, when you pray, you need to first remind yourself who your father is. Even before you pray, you've you got to remind yourself who your father is. Then secondly, I think on this roadmap, Jesus is going to say, I want you to listen before you actually speak. Don't start praying. I want you to listen first to what I have to say before you speak. And then thirdly, pray. Okay? So those three things. So let's begin with the first one. Number one, I believe Jesus would say, when you pray, first remind yourself. Can you bring that up for me? First remind yourself of who your father is. Look what he says, Matthew 6, 9. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Jesus has given us an image of who we're actually praying to. He's saying, when you pray, you're praying to your heavenly father, which means if we want to learn how to pray better prayers, don't, don't pay attention to religious people. Pay attention to kids and the way that kids interact with their father when they're well-loved. Jesus says, you want to learn how to pray better? Remind yourself that you're praying to your heavenly father. Your father, right? I mean, think about it. How do kids interact with their dad if they're well-loved? Do they come up? Like my kids, I got five of them. My kids, they never come up. 
Dad, Dad, is this, is, this a good, is this a good time to talk, Dad? I beseech you, O Father of mine, please give me your attention just for a fleeting moment. No, you know what my kids do? They did it to me this morning. They come up to my office door. <laughs> hey, Dad! I want you to look at this dress I just put on. Hey, Dad! And then whatever it is, they just, they, they're so shameless. So audacious. They, they know, right? Because they know Dad, Dad loves me. My, my youngest, Reese. Oh, man. I love all my kids. I love her most. Now I'm just yelling. I really don't. But she's still that age where she still fits when I hold her, you know? My son came up and I was holding him during worship and it's kind of like this now, right? I'm a short guy and he's getting bigger. But, but my daughter, Reese, you know, she'll come up and, and she'll be just wanting my attention and sometimes I'll be working and I'll be on my, my, my laptop or something and she'll come into my lap. Hey, Dad, guess what I just made with Play-Doh? And I'm just doing one of these. Oh, yeah, that's amazing. Good job. Uh-huh, uh-huh. No, Dad, look. Uh-huh. Oh, that's amazing, baby. And you know what she'll do if I'm not paying attention? She'll cut my face in her hands. Dad, look. <laughs> right? Why? Because she's well-loved. And she comes and she just thinks, there's nothing better that dad could be doing except listening to me. Like, I'm abs- why wouldn't I be the most important thing in his life? And she knows, like, any time, any moment, she can come up and she can get my attention. And Jesus says, look, if you want to learn how to pray shameless, audacious prayers, that's what you need to remind yourself of before anything else. You just go, hey, I'm praying to my heavenly father. Now, if, if you want to know what kind of dad I am, don't ask my wife. You've got to ask my kids, right? They're the best source of knowledge on what type of father I am. And in the same way, if you're not uh, very familiar with uh, the character of your heavenly father, the best place that you can go to get that kind of information is his son, Jesus. So if you want to know more about who your father in heaven is, just look at what Jesus says about him. And it's interesting enough, John, the apostle, who is Jesus' best friend during Jesus' ministry, actually says as much. This is John chapter 1, verse 18. He says this, no one has ever seen God. No one really knows what God the Father is like. No one's ever seen him. But the one and only Son, is Jesus, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, he's made him known. If you want to know more about your Father, just see what Jesus had to say about him. And I I was just picturing this morning, okay, if Jesus was here on the stage telling us about the Father, what would he say? I came up with three things. These are all based on scripture. Three things I think God would want to remind you of as you're getting ready to pray some shameless, audacious prayers. Number one is this, God is good. He would say, guys, you need to remember as you're beginning to pray, God is good. Good. And actually, Jesus says exactly that. Right after he tells this parable, he says this in verse 11. He says, you fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. And then he uses a logic argument. He says, so if you sinful people, he said, you're all just, you're just a bunch of evil sinful bunch, you know? If you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father, right? He's saying your heavenly father is gooder than gooder than gooder than you ever are, right? And in case you're questioning my intelligence, I know that's not a real word. How much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He just say, look, guys, when you're praying, the first step, just remember your father's good. And if you're having a hard time remember that, just remember that he demonstrated his goodness most, best, through the sacrifice of his son on the cross. That Jesus died and experienced hell so that you wouldn't have to. If that doesn't convince you of the goodness of your father, I, I really don't know what will. Here's the second thing if Jesus was on the stage. Here's the second thing I think he would say. I think you'd say, look guys, when you're praying to your father, Don't base your prayers on your track record. Base it upon mine. 
When you're praying to your heavenly father, your father's not looking at your track record of how good you've done or how poor you've done, how much sin, how often. You, he said, what he's looking at is my track record, the perfect life that I, Jesus, lived, the, the, the finished work that I accomplished for you on the cross. And, and that does something very important for us because anytime we pray, there's always that temptation to come in you know, that comes in that says, well, did I earn it? You know, like, how many times I read my Bible this week? Oh, no, I looked at something I shouldn't have on the internet. Oh, I can't pray. Got to give God some time to cool off before I ask that prayer request. And Jesus is like, no, you repent of sin. You seek forgiveness. You're granted it. And when you're praying, it's based upon the finished work of Jesus. It's not based upon your good works. And it brings us to this place where we can just be confident in our heavenly Father's midst. That when we're asking, it's like, well, you love me. You showed me that you love me on the cross. So why wouldn't I receive it? And I know it, it, I don't have to earn your love. I don't have to earn these answers to prayer. I'm coming in Jesus' name. That's why Jesus instructs us. When you pray, you're gonna pray in my name. I mean, how ridiculous. Heavenly Father, I come and I pray to you in the name of Ryan. He's like, sorry, not impressed, denied. <laughs> Lord, I come and I pray in the name of Jesus, knowing that he died for me, knowing that his perfect life has earned righteousness for me and I'm clothed in that righteousness, right? When you look at the, the, the armor of God in Ephesians, you know, it talks about the, the breastplate of righteousness. You know what that is? The word righteousness, it means approval, acceptance, that you're literally suiting up with God's approval, completely approved of, accepted by your heavenly Father, not because of anything good you've done, but because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. And so I think Jesus would say, look, when you're coming to pray, just remind yourself that this is based upon my track record. And here's a third thing if Jesus was standing right here and reminding us about the Father, I think he'd say this. You need to remind yourself that nothing is impossible with God. Remind yourself God's good. Remind yourself that this is based upon my track record, not yours. And then you need to sit back and remind yourself, even before you open your mouth, just remind yourself there's no situation that is beyond God's power and grace. There is nothing that's impossible with God. You know, Jesus would say that. He'll say nothing's impossible for God and, and all of us. You know, we're like, oh yeah, I agree with that. But Jesus doesn't allow us the comfort of remaining in that generality. And he says, nothing is impossible for the one who believes God. Ooh, now the rubber just met the road. And so he's like, okay, just remember you're praying to your Father in heaven. Here's the second thing. First, we remind ourselves of who we're praying to, our Heavenly Father. Number two, uh, the second piece of this roadmap is this. When you pray, listen first before you speak. When you pray, listen first, and then speak. You know, some of us think of prayer as just me speaking to God. No wonder you're so bored in prayer. Like the things you have to say just aren't that interesting. But the things that God wants to speak to you, that's where the fun is. That's the interesting stuff. And so when we come to pray, before we just go through our laundry list, we just gotta go, oh, I'm gonna listen first. Jesus says as much, look at this. Verse 10 of Matthew 6, he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now we look at this and some of us are like, okay, that means when I come to pray, I'm just gonna pray, Father, just let your will be done. And we kind of assume this role of like God's cheerleader as if he needed one. Go God, you can do it. Your will be done. Give me a G, give me an O, give me a D. You got this God, just let your will be done. And we start praying in generalities, thinking that's what Jesus is asking for us, when it's the furthest from the truth. When Jesus says, I want you to pray, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it's an invitation for us to listen and discover what God's specific will is for us in this moment, in this season. It's an invitation for us to hear what God's will is for anything that he's given us influence over. Literally, it's, it's us going, okay, God, what are you speaking right now? What are you praying right now that I can join in and pray to? You guys ever feel like, you know, you've had a time where you're just like, I just don't know what to pray. 
right? I had a couple come to me last week and they're like, yeah, we were at the, the wonder night and everyone was praying and then we prayed a little bit and then we were like, well, I went through my thank you list. I got nothing else to say. Why is everyone still praying? You ever been there? I have. And, and, and the apostle Paul actually recognizes that and in Romans eight twenty six, he says, none of y'all know how to pray as you should. He says, but the Holy Spirit is interceding for you with groans too deep for words. Literally, the Holy Spirit is praying for you. Now, I don't know about you, but that's the prayer that I want to get on board with. And so when Jesus says, I want you to pray like this, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, I'm turning my ears on before I open my mouth and saying, God, what's on your heart right now? What are you speaking? What's the Holy Spirit already praying for me, for my community, for my family, that I can just join my prayer to you and pray as well. John, again, we'll look at him, you know, Jesus' best friend. He said it like this in 1 John. Uh, and he's speaking to how we can come to that place of confidently, persistently praying. 1 John uh, chapter 5, beginning in verse 14, says this. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to what? His will. Our, our Father in heaven, Right? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He says, look, you can come confidently in prayer if you're praying according to his will because we know he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. So if we know that we're praying something according to God's will, we become confident in praying. And we start pounding and waking up everybody. And if we know that it's his will and we're confident, we know that we're going to have it because we know that it's something that God already wants to do. So Jesus is like, look, remind yourself who you're praying to and then spend some time and figure out what God's will is for the moment. Spend some time and figure out what God wants to do, not just what you want to do. Start praying like that. Then you're going to be able to pray these shameless, audacious prayers. Then your batting average is going to go up. Well, how do we know what the will of God is? Glad you asked. Two ways. Number one, read your Bible. Every promise you see in scripture is God putting down pen and paper for all eternity what his desires are, what his will is. There's over 7,000. So when you see a promise, you go, this is what God says he wants to do. I'm gonna get behind that. I'm gonna start praying that. And it's so fun because as you, Shut your mouth and listen first. The Holy Spirit's gonna bring specific promises to your mind and say, hey, this is, this is what I'm about right now. This is what we're going after. You know, let's pray for this. Let's get on board with this today. Put your energy, put your effort, put your shameless audacity behind this and let's see God do what he's promised to do. It's so fun. You guys wanna see one of the promises? You know, I get asked this all the time. Ryan, how is it that we as a church pray so consistently and with confidence for the healing of those who are sick when we don't already always see them healed? And I say, it's simple. God promised to do it. Yeah, but we don't always see everyone healed. I said, I know. I don't understand that, but God promised to do it. And so I'm going to pray for it. I'll show you something fun. This, is, this one you get for free. 1 John 5.14, where I looked at, John, again, same John, says... You can have confidence to pray when you know it's God's will and you know you're going to get the answer you're looking for if you're praying according to his will. And then John, in another letter he wrote to a guy named Gaius, unfortunate name I know, but to this guy named Gaius, third John, he says this in verse two. He says, beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. Here's John, the same guy that said, I don't, you know, we only can be confident that God's gonna answer what his will is, what he's promised to do. He's writing that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Then he's writing this other letter under the same inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which means this is God expressing his revelation, his desires through John in this letter, saying, look, I pray that you're healthy. The same way that Jesus has come in and he's given you new life in your spirit and your soul is prospering because of the work of God in you, I pray that same thing for your body. Now here's the thing. If you see one of the good guys in scripture praying a prayer, 
that's probably a great prayer to, you know, prayer to pray also. You can, you can feel pretty confident about that one, right? And so one of the ways we know, okay, what's the will of God? How, we just look at what does scripture say that God has promised to do? And then we get behind that and we start praying. The second way, and this one gets a little bit more dangerous, but it's a lot of fun. The second way we know what the will of God is, is we ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to us in the moment. Now for you Greek scholars, this is called the rhema word. This is what God is speaking right in the moment, okay? And we're saying, Lord, in John 10, I believe it is, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Which means if you've given your life to Jesus, part of the, the, the stewardship that you have now is to actually learn how to hear God on a moment by moment basis. Now everything we think we hear, we always compare to what the word, the written word of God says, right? Like if you're praying one morning and you just gotten in a fight with your wife the night before and you're, you're praying and you're like, I just feel the Lord saying, leave my wife. That's probably not God speaking to you, right? God says he hates divorce, all, all those things, right? So we always compare it to the word of God, but it does not take away from the fact that Jesus says this is a way that the Lord's gonna speak to you. You see Jesus demonstrating this. You know, he made these audacious statements like, I only say what I hear the Father saying. Well, Jesus would say stuff that wasn't written in scripture, at least not yet. He's, he's quoting the Old Testament. He wasn't even quoting the Old Testament. He's speaking things and he's saying, I'm only speaking when I hear my Father speaking. I only do the things, he said, that I see my father do. How did he know what God was speaking and what God was doing? It was the anointing of the Holy Spirit on him. He was listening even before he opened his mouth and prayed. What, what's your will right now, Father? What are you doing in this situation? And it's so fun. Can I share one that just happened about 30 minutes ago? At the end of the early service, um, we were closing in prayer and I felt like the Lord began speaking to me. This happens sometimes about a specific person with a, you know, a specific um, injury to the body and it was really an embarrassing one. And, and I almost didn't give it, but I said, look, I feel like there's someone here that's having a hard time urinating and that it's burning a lot. And in fact, I feel like the Lord's saying that you actually have little tears in your urethra. And you're like, did he just say urethra? Yes. So I'm taking a risk, you know? And sure enough, I said, don't raise your hand. Don't worry, we're not gonna lay hands on you. But I just said, you know, if it's you, come up. Sure enough, a guy jumps up and he said, I just had surgery. There was complications. They actually tore my urethra. It's been killing me. And I'm sitting there more amazed than he is. <laughs> like, whoa, <laughs> that's amazing what God just did, right? It's 30 minutes ago. So we prayed for him and we're trusting because of what John said and what James said. If any among you are sick, pray. The prayer offered up in faith will heal the one. We're just trusting God. If you brought it to our attention, it must mean that you want to heal it. So Lord, do what you've promised, right? It's just how it works. And so in your prayer life, if you want to pray those audacious prayers, it sure helps to know what God wants you to pray for. That's my point. And then once you know, then you can put your faith behind that. Then you can get passionate, persistent, excited. Then you can become a little childlike. Daddy, 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 right? And say, Lord, I'm not giving you any rest. Not because I just want this thing, but because this is what you've told me is your will and desire to do. So that's what I'm going to do. Now, some of you are like, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't hear God like that. How do I even do that? That's the fun of developing relationship with God. You know, when I first married my wife, she would say something to me, and I would just believe that she meant what she said. 14 years later, she says something to me, and I go, oh, no, no, I understand what she's really saying. You got me? That couldn't happen at year one. It took 14 years, maybe 12 it's the same way in your relationship with God. That's why it's called a relationship with God. Over time, over practice, some trial and error as you're constantly going back to scripture, does this line up with the word as you're constantly testing, you know, what you think you hear the Father saying, 
you'll begin to grow in your knowledge of what it feels like, what, it's, you know, what it sounds like, what it, just the sensory experience of what it means to, to hear God communicating to you specifically. And one of the best ways to grow in this, get a journal, get a pen, submit your heart to Jesus. Jesus, I want to hear you. If there's sin in my life, reveal it. I repent of it. I just want to get, I clean before you because of what you've done on the cross, and I just want to hear you speak. You go there, and then you just write out whatever comes to mind. It's kind of scary, but it's a whole lot of fun. And you write it out, and it's been interesting if I, as I've done this. You know, more often than not, I'll come back and read it. My first question, is this line up with scripture? Okay, yep, good there. And I'll read it, and I'll go, man, I, I really do think this is God speaking to me. I'll give you one last story, one last example, and then we'll close. Uh, I had the privilege of taking my whole family to England about a month ago. Uh, because we felt like the Lord told us to, to go there because we were going to meet with some church planters. And we had one in particular that was set up, but we felt like the Lord was, said there was going to be more. And so we're getting the family together months in advance because we're just not sure, like, are we supposed to go or are we not? And felt like the Lord said, you're going to know it's me once you go and you get there. I'm like, all right. And, and we're praying, and, and uh, one of these times we're praying before we leave on the trip, my wife says, I just got this picture, I don't know what it means, I see this kind of, you know, just large, jolly man with a red beard and red hair, and he's just laughing hysterically, and he's just so, you know, just fun and jolly, and he's standing in this big green field. I'm like, well, that doesn't sound like God, but let's just write it down. So we're in London, fast forward about a month, we're in London, and we've gotten to that point in our day with our children where we dare not bring them into any confined public space. So we go to find uh, a park and we're letting them play. And there's only one other couple in this park. We're in Hyde Park, if you know, if you've ever been there. And we're, they're on this playground. And so we strike up this conversation with this couple and we're just talking. Well, we come to find out about 15 minutes into the conversation that they're church planters. And about three and a half years ago, they planted a church in one of the worst part in Wales. And so we're just talking, we're excited, like, oh, God told us we're going to see church. Blah, 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 blah. And, and, and about 20 minutes in the conversation, my wife goes, boom. I was like, what? She's like, that's the guy I saw in my picture a month ago when we were praying. And if you've been to Hyde Park, you know it's just acres of green fields. Here's this guy, the same one. It was the Lord saying, look, you're in my will. This is what you're supposed to go on. I mean, the, the chances, if you've been to London, London is just amazing, but it's a nightmare all at the same time. <laughs> There's people everywhere. I mean, the chances that we would meet another couple that are church planters that God showed my wife, they had, it's just like, but it's what the Holy Spirit does, right? Which brings me to my third and final point, and then we'll close, is this. Remind yourself of who your father is. Listen before you speak. And then thirdly, start praying. Pray whatever it is that God shows you. Can you bring that up for me? I want him to see it. No? All right. That's okay. I'll just read it to you. Just pray what God tells you to pray or pray whatever is pressing on your heart. Pray whatever is pressing on your heart. And you go, isn't our hearts deceitful above all things? Isn't that a little dangerous? It is if you haven't done step one and two. But if you've come and reminded yourself of the goodness and the greatness of your heavenly father, and if you've come and said, Lord, I want to know what your will right, is right now, and I've submitted my heart to your desires, my, I'm submitting my desires to your desires, Jesus, then you start praying, and whatever the Lord presses in on your heart, go for it, as long as it lines up with scripture. Because at that point, you're probably praying the exact same thing that's on the Lord's heart. That's how our batting average increases. That's how we become confident in prayer. That, I believe, according to Jesus, is how we're gonna see our prayers answered. And let me just say this. This is not just so you can have more wow moments. This is not just so you can get what you want. This is to see the kingdom of God extended. This is to see evangelism take place, not just with tracks and scripts, but to see it take place with the power of the Holy Spirit so lives are absolutely changed and transformed. This isn't just for us. Part of it is. God's gonna do it. But this is for the kingdom. Got it? All right, let's pray. Jesus, we love you. 
thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we can come before you, Father, knowing you are good, knowing that nothing is impossible with you. Thank you that you've revealed your will to us and that we get to align our will with yours and pray confidently, shamelessly, audaciously, persistently according to what you said you want to do. And we're just grateful for that, Lord. And, and I just ask, Holy Spirit, there just be like a fresh passion inside of us. Stir us up. Relight some fires. Stoke some flames in us this week, Lord, to pray those kinds of prayers. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen.